Good afternoon. I'm Ariel Cohen, Chairman of the Rubenstein Society Board of Directors, and I welcome you to ARVP, Arthur Rubinstein Virtual Piano Fest, a series of live broadcasts taking place at the very same dates originally planned for the Rubinstein competition. These broadcasts bring together our enthusiastic audience, a selection of our renowned prize winners, and a young group of pianists, some of whom have served as the young jury in our last competition, or will be members of the young jury in the coming competition. Our partners in these broadcasts are the Buchmann Meta School of Music at Tel Aviv University, Haaretz newspaper, and our UK partner, International Piano Magazine. Today's broadcast is dedicated to Israeli compositions in the Rubinstein competition. Excuse me for a little bit of history. Since the first international piano competition, the Anton Rubinstein competition, not to be confused with Arthur Rubinstein, in St. Petersburg, which took place 130 years ago, piano competitions have gone through a long transition. Lisa McCormick, investigating the history of piano competitions, uh, has found a gradual progression towards a truly modern competition format. The first competitions were hampered by corruption uh, uh, and forces of nationalism, nepotism, and ideology. Throughout the years, the international format of competitions developed and proliferated in spite of the polluting influences that continually undermined, undermined its cosmopolitan potential. But there is uh, maybe uh, a one, one thing that did not change during those times, there is something which is sort of nationalistic, a feature that we still have in current competitions uh, and in most of the prominent piano competitions, and this is the inclusion of commissioned compositions of local composers as compulsory pieces to be performed by the contestants. Our competition, the Rubinstein Competition too, has long tradition of commissioning Israeli compositions but we decided to do it differently this time. In cooperation with the Israel Music Institute, we announced a competition for Israeli composers in order to choose two piano pieces for the coming competition and two additional piano works to be published by the Israel Music Institute. Submissions were anonymous. The committee appointed to choose the winning compositions received the scores without any names or personal details of the submitting composers. All members of the committee are present here in the Claremont Hall at Tel Aviv University to participate in this discussion. So let me please introduce them. Pianist Ofra Itzraki, pianist Michal Tal, the composer Moshe Zorman, the composer Oded Zehavi, and the composer Joseph Bardanashvili. Both Michal and Ofra are dedicated and enthusiastic performers of Israeli piano music, and all the three of our composers are well known in Israel, and all of them have written uh, uh, compositions for the Rubinstein competition in the past. So let me ask you, and I would like to begin uh, with the composers. Let me ask you how one prepares to compose a piece for a piano competition. Is it different from the normal process of composing? אולי נתחיל ממך, יוסף ברדנשווילי, איך ניגשים לכתוב יצירה חדשה לתחרות פסנתר? האם זה שונה מתהליך ההלחנה הרגיל? הוא לא שונה, אחריות, אותה אחריות תמיד נשארת. אבל לכתוב לתחרות זה קצת קשה בגלל זה יש מסגרת, כאילו זה תחרות והמחשבה הראשונה לכתוב משהו וירטואוזי, מבריק ומדי פעם אנחנו שוכחים את זה, צריך לכתוב מוזיקה, אחר כך לחשוב כל הדברים האחרים שבא מאחור הכתיבה. Let me, let me just translate. Okay. Uh, יוסף ברדנשווילי said that it's uh, not uh, really different, it's the same responsibility. But still, uh, composing for a competition is a little bit more difficult because there is a tendency to think about virtuosity, to write virtuosic music, but uh, you must not forget all the other aspects. 
למצוא חדש, אה, בגדול זה מילה חדש, מה חדש, כאילו. הלפסנתר כתבו מלחינים ענקים ואנחנו מאוד קטנים, יכול להיות, אבל אמביציות יש להם, מספיק אמביציות גם לנו לעשות משהו חדש. מה זה חדש? זה היה בדיוק הנקודה שאם פעם אנחנו נתקעים על זה, מה חדש, כאילו מה לעשות? עכשיו מוזיקה חדשה, מה שכותבים על פסנתר, די מורכבת. היום אם לקחת מפה לפסנתר, זה כבר לא פסנתר של לא ליסט, לא שופן, לא שומברג, יכול להיות לא מכינים אחרים, אותו שוסטקוביץ', בואו נכין יותר קדימה, זה כבר ליגטי פליוס, זאת אומרת שם כאילו בקשות אחרות והטכניקה היא אחרת. מה, זה בדיוק הפחד, מדי פעם אתה כותב, כאילו מתקדם, ואתה חושב שהפסנתרנים שמגיעים עדיין זה הם צעירים, פסנתרנים רק מתחילים עכשיו להרגיש החומר. ואיכשהו צריך למצוא האיזום הנכון, לעזור להם ולהיות אמיתי. זאת אומרת, זה הבעיה, להיות אמיתי ראשון, איכשהו להגיע ברצון שלך לכתוב יצירה חדשה, מצד שני, לעשות משהו חדש, מבריק, שגם מייצג מדינה, זה גם לא פחות חשוב. גם מייצג התרבות שלנו ומייצג הפסנתר החדש. So, uh, יוסף ברדנשווילי says that uh, as a composer you want to, to do new things, to innovate. Uh, and uh, in spite of the fact that there are so many uh, piano music composers from the past, current musicians and composers still want to innovate. And the question is how to do it. Uh, you cannot write like uh, Chopin was writing, and uh, during the years, uh, the music for piano evolved, and he mentioned different composers like Liszt, Schoenberg, Shostakovich, Ligeti, and uh, you want to do something new, but still stay connected to some tradition, to the tradition that you, you had, and in the same time, you want to, to be real, to do something real, to be sincere, and to, uh, in the same time, uh, represent your culture, your country, and help the pianists to get, to get uh, a way to show their abilities. Of course, of course. Well, Dad, what do you have to say about this issue? Well, I have to say that to a degree... Uh, uh, sorry, Oded uh, Zahavi, uh, we, move, we move back to English now. Oh, yes. Okay, I, I, th I think so, I'll sp unless you would like to translate. You can translate <laughs> it to Hebrew <laughs> afterwards. Uh, <laughs> but for me, there was a bit of, of provocation approaching the commission from the uh, Rubinstein competition. Because I said, I sat through many competitions. I was uh, one of the... assistant and then producers for the Israeli radio. So did you, I think. And, for, and for, for, for years, I sat there and heard all these pieces. I figured that I'm yearning to one piece that will have a simple melody in it. And since I didn't get any of it, I've decided to provide one in my piece. And I think that tomorrow you will hear the piece and you see that it ends with a monodic. Melody, I figure after all these lists and Rachmaninovs, that would be so refreshing. And you know, the late uh, Pnina Zaltzman, who was uh, a, a juror in this competition, said, Zahavi, you'll go to heaven no matter how evil you've done in your life because you provided <laughs> us with few minutes of, of ear relaxation in your uh, piece. So that was one thing. And then getting from there, I wanted to write an Ars Poetic piece. about these people that are running from comp competition to competition. And in this competition, we had a couple of uh, regular horses, you know, that at the end, a few years later, won. And, you know, I was just thinking, these people, I'm sure, before they go to sleep, they think, why am I in music? So my piece starts with some lullaby or with <laughs> some, some, some church bells that they have heard and made them, you know, pianists, and then all their current life, which gave me the excuse to do all the technical thing. And then at the end, they, they, they remembered the lullaby their mother sang them. And it, was, it, it, it wasn't any quote of folk thing, but I've created something that was simple for simplicity's sake. Um, now, as a, as, a, as, a juror, as, as a juror for this competition, as an evaluator of the pieces that I saw, I think that very few of them took the courage to be simple for a moment. Just, you know, to be simple like a good Schumann, good Ligeti, good Messien, good George Crumb, good Bardenashvili, and others. You know, I mean, there is tradition of direct approach to piano. 
I hardly saw it here. Let me ask the third composer in our panel, Moshe Zorman. Is it different to compose? It is different because you know that you are writing to people who are coming from all over the world. So in order to catch their attention, you have to think of something that perhaps they know and they uh, appreciate. So in my case, it was a piece that was based basically on a, on a theme by George Gershwin, which I was sure everybody knows. It was fascinating rhythm. So in the minute it came to this kind of quotation, everybody was happy. But other than that, we have, we have to know that the, 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 the competition is a competition, and the pianists need to show their ability. You cannot uh, write a, a piece for, for, for a competition uh, in a largo rhythm with a lot of uh, silence in between notes. Nobody will pick it up, and it will not survive after the question. My idea was, how can a, a piece survive after the competition ends, and it will continue it's living in our uh, concerts. And I was lucky, because of Gershwin, not because of me, mm. that people are still playing this work till now. And Michal will play it tomorrow, after yes, tomorrow. Yes. Uh, in, so in this concert. is really unique, yes. because, you know, uh, uh, some composers, notably Tzvi Avni, uses to say that uh, everyone that commissions a, a, a new piece wants it for, for the premiere. Uh, but then no one performs it again. So you're lucky if your co co composition <laughs> is performed. That's the mechanism of the, of the competition because you are exposed to so many uh, uh, pianists and their teachers and their friends and the ones that will show everybody that they can play it better. So yeah, it, it does generate some, some activity. That's true. The idea if it will continue living after the competition yeah, 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 exactly. ends. That's the idea. Yeah. Now let's ask our pianists. Uh, you're both uh, enthusiastic performers of Israeli music. Do you see difference between uh, piano pieces written for competitions and other ones? I must say that for me, music is music. I, I think I should play Israeli music because I'm living here and I was born here and this is my country, this is my language. I believe also in good education from the moment the child starts to play the piano, the child has to understand that there's composers living here, lived here before. A country that respects uh, its poets and its writers, supposed to respect at the same breath uh, the composers. And I was lucky because I got good education most of my life. My teachers encouraged me to play contemporary music, Israeli music. And I must say that I reflect many years ago in Tanglewood Festival, that was many years ago, the great master Leon Fleischer was there. And the contemporary festival, we had to play tons of contemporary music of composers that we didn't even know about. And some uh, students came to Leon Fleischer and said, but why do I have to play this music? I want to play Beethoven. I didn't come here to play contemporary music. And Fleischer answered the students, because if you understand and play contemporary music, you will understand Beethoven finally. You have to understand what composers are writing now. And I remember it until now that First of all, the education that I got made me love to play this music. And second of all is the personal relationship with the composers. For me, it's very important to know the person who wrote this music. Unfortunately, many composers are not living and we cannot meet them, but lots of them are. And that's what we are at the Jerusalem Music Center trying to educate the young pianist program and we encourage them at a young age to play Israeli music, to know about the composers. And children get to know this music and feel very free and natural as they're younger. This was a very beautiful answer to an unasked question. <laughs> <laughs> but if so. you want to refer to Israeli compositions that yes. were written for the competition, I must say that I agree very much what Odette says about the simplicity. I looked for compositions 
that said something very personal, very intimate, not all, all the time, but very, very sincere. I like when a composer writes in a certain sincere way. The technique or the language is different. Each composer today is writing in a totally different language. So are you hinting that uh, uh, composers writing for piano competitions write differently, maybe write more virtuosic things? Or? Yeah, it is obvious that if you write for virtuoso pianism or piano competition, you want to write very flashy music too. It's okay. I mean, I respect that too. And some compositions were like that as well. What do you think? Yeah, I also had a feeling, as uh, Michal said that, uh, and Odette, that um, a lot of the pieces were very virtuosic. I had the, f the feeling that, that um, many composers thought, oh, these are very virtuoso pianists, we should give them a, a lot of notes to play. Um, I also had the feeling that maybe a lot of com the composers tried to, com to have something that is fairly communicative um, I mean, from the many pieces that we were looking at I think there were hardly any pieces that uh, were really what we fear as uh, avant-garde uh, difficult music they were all quite uh, easy to take for uh, let's say non an audience that is not uh, used to modern music so I, I thought that a lot of the composers were going to trying to go along these la lines of uh, music that is uh, virtuoso and um, somehow uh, able to uh, communicate um, I think this maybe has to do with uh, composing for a competition um, I, I also thought I mean, a lot of the pieces were either I mean virtuoso in the sense that they were uh, composed as a toccata or a rhapsody or some kind of a form like that. I mean they, they were uh, there were much less uh, uh, pieces composed as a sonata or uh, in, in, in such a, in, in a certain uh, form uh, like that than uh, pieces that use kind of the motoric uh, motoric uh, force of uh, fast rhythm to move the thing ahead so I felt there were there was much more uh, uh, importance um, lying on this uh, motoric thing than let's say on big structural forms now um, and uh, on the other hand I also thought that a lot of composers were using all kinds of uh, were trying to make their music more speaking more easy more communicative through using all kinds of programmatic uh, idea a lot of uh, kinds of miniatures um, about all kinds of topics uh, some were trying to I, I, I was thinking actually about how, how do these pieces look in relation to let's say Israeli music of 50 years ago and what I found uh, found interesting just one second on that, is, is that uh, I mean, there were all kinds of tries to uh, use let's say something like a hora or something like a clay smell or, but usually it was made with kind of an ironic touch a little bit and not, not with this uh, sincerity that this is what, what we believe in. This I found, and now let's... Yeah. <laughs> you May I add something, please? May I? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two things that I lacked in many of the pieces, and I think it's a matter of ego. One is a sense of humor. And there, there was very hardly, I mean, I feel very comfortable because both Yosef and Moishe Zoman here, my colleagues, are known to have a very good sense of humor that in many cases find itself into the scores, in the, into their scores. And there is something about being able not to take yourself, take yourself very seriously, but allow yourself a little bit of removed uh, angle on the topic. And I really think it's because of the ego. Because when you are ap approaching a competition, you try to please someone, 99 of us, I mean subconsciously. And when you are commissioned a piece, you say, you know, in the worst case, I've gotten the money. You know, so I'll write what I believe in. I see. Before continuing our discussion, let us listen to an Israeli composition, uh, and in this case, to Shimon Nering, the first prize winner of the Rubinstein, the last Rubinstein competition, uh, playing uh, one of the commissioned uh, uh, compositions, Compulsory works, uh, which was Sonata Number no. Five by Avner Dorman, Shimon Erig. Thank you. 
This was Shimo Nering, a recording from the last Arthur Rubinstein piano competition, playing uh, Avner Dorman's Piano Sonata Number no. 5. Uh, dear committee members, uh, had we known that there will be 48 submissions of compositions to be judged by you, uh, I guess we would have uh, defined another st first stage to eliminate the majority and leave a smaller amount of composition and then let you choose among the ones selected. But we were really surprised to get uh, so many submissions. And I want to ask you, having received to your hands 48 scores of piano music written now, uh, do you have any s insights about uh, the status of the Israeli piano music at least today? Uh, did you see any interesting trends or directions? נתחיל ממך, יוסף ברדנשווילי, קיבלתם ליד 48 יצירות ישראליות שנכתבו עכשיו. האם יש לך איזה תובנות על מה המצב של מוזיקה ישראלית לפסנתר היום מהיצירות האלה? האם מצאת איזה שהם כיוונים חדשים, אופנה חדשה? מאוד שמחתי שהמון מלכינים ישראלים השתתפו, זה ממש משמח לי. וכמה שאני מבין, זה יעלום שם, אז uh, לא כל כך הכרתי מי המלחינים מאחור התווים, אבל הבנתי שהיו מלחינים צעירים, היו ממש כל, כל מיני דורות, וזה היה מאוד מאוד משמח. זאת אומרת, עדיין עניין לכתוב לפסנתר זה נשאר, זה חשוב. Uh, לגבי רמה, את כתיבה, או כמה זה מייצג מוזיקה ישראלית, לא הייתי ככה להשוות, בגלל זה מוזיקה ישראלית, אני, אני חושב, אחד המעניינים. Uh, בעולם המוזיקלית, ככה הייתי להגיד, uh, לא שאני מארץ, פשוט אני יודע, הרמה של המחשבות מלחינים מצוינים יש לנו. Uh, לגבי יצירות לפסנתר, הייתי להגיד שקצת אני הייתי עצוב שלא מצאתי משהו חדש, זה חיפוש חדש. לא מצאתי, כאילו זה, הם היו כאילו במסגרת של תחרות, לכתוב כמה שווירטואוזי, כמו שעופרה אמרה גם, כאילו כמה שלשגע פסנתרן. ופחות חיפשו הפואטיקה של פסנתר, הפואטיקה היא דבר מאוד מורכב, יש מה לעשות עדיין. אני חושב, מבחינה זו שאנחנו שמענו עכשיו יצירה של דולמן, זה מייצג צד אחד, יצירה וירטואוזית, מבריקה, אפקטיבית לפסנתרנים. מצד אחד, אני יודע שמתוכנן uh, לשמוע יצירה של בטי אוליברו, שדווקא היא חיפשה לא הווירטואוזיות, וירטואוזית אחרת, וירטואוזית אנושית. זה מדי פעם יותר חשוב, לא הפורטיסימו, בוא נגיד, לא הפסאז' עם הטרמול או המשתגעת, ממש מוזיקה עמוקה, פנימית, אז דווקא שם בודקים הפסנתרן שלוקח לפני חודש יצירה חדשה, כמה הוא מוצא בעצמו. בגלל זה המון דברים מלמדים מורים, אנחנו יודעים שכולם לומדים לפני תחרות למורים ומגיעים, אבל כשלוקחים יצירה ישראלית אין להם כמעט זמן ללמוד, אז, הם, אז אתה רואה פנים של פסנתרן, כמה הוא אומן, כמה הוא מחפש. ההרמוניה זה כמה הוא מצליח למצוא בעצמו בתוך היצירה של הביטי אוליברו או מישהו אחר, מי שמחפש פואטיקה חדשה. Yes, let me translate. יוסף uh, ברדנשווילי said that he, he was very happy to see uh, so many submissions. Uh, there were, it was all anonymous, so he didn't recognize uh, the composers, but he felt that there was a diversity of ages. There were some young, younger and some older composers, so more experienced and less experienced composers. Uh, then uh, you said that uh, the Israeli music composed nowadays, not specifically for piano, is one of the most interesting in the world uh, when you compare it to other compositions written around the world. But specifically in, in, this, in the range of comp compositions that uh, you have seen uh, during the, uh, this process of selection, uh, you didn't find any, any new ideas, any new search, search for new ways, uh, but mainly uh, an attempt to write virtuosic music, less poetic, uh, and, uh, and this was missing for you. Uh, you mentioned that the composition of uh, Dorman that we've just heard is more in the virtuosic side, and uh, the last composition that we'll hear today by Bet Betty Olivero, Olivero is not uh, pianistically virtuosic, but uh, uh, humanly virtuosic, uh, and uh, it, it lets you uh, see how uh, young pianists uh, uh, take a, a composition, they have only one month or maybe a little more time to learn it, and uh, how it reflects on their personality. Odette. Well, 
Uh, I was saddened by something else. There were very few pieces that for me showed any uh, connection to a learned tradition of writing uh, for piano, both Israeli and abroad. I hardly heard any, uh, I would say, grandchildren of Messien or of Mordechai Setter or, or Tzvi Avni or Ben Zion Orgad or Shulamit Ran, just to mention a few. I mean, and, and you know what? I'll say something really mean. I have seen very few of these composers, because by now I know their name, in the latest recitals given by Ofra Yitzchaki. Uh, every, every year we have uh, a, a great recital curated carefully, boutique recital by Ofra Yitzchaki of Israeli music, of the best pieces, really, uh, the best of the best. And I didn't see, I can, I almost can swear, I didn't see any of the composers that applied for this competition in these concerts. And there are so very few people in the audience, so I know every and each one of them. And if I'm mistaking by a name or two, I, I apologize. I have to say that the piece that uh, won the competition by Alon Nechoshtan was very interesting because it showed some connection to the paintings of Mordechai Ardon yes. and had some spiritual statement basically based on something that in a way is Israeli and even Jewish. It wasn't superficial, it was quite fascinating. And beyond issues of technique of composition, there is, there is I think there is an importance to tradition and, and whether we want it or not, there is a tradition of Israeli music for piano and it does not and with the sonatina of Paul Ben Chaim, that is semi Yamanite, according to that day and age. Maybe it's uh, the right time to mention uh, the names of the two, uh, the composers and the compositions that were selected by you uh, for the coming competition, Rubinstein competition. Uh, and these are uh, Tokata Caprice by Yoram Miyuchas and Walk in the Shadow of Giants by Alon Nechushtan. We decided. Uh, to add a third composition, uh, three street cortèges for, con for concert piano by Sergio Natra. But before that, let's hear uh, what uh, Moshe has to say about the previous question. Uh, it's a hard question. In order to write both very virtuosic piece and with some emotion in it, you have to be a genius. You can find it in Schumann when he writes the Toccata Opus 7, yeah. It's the most difficult piece in, on earth, but in a minute or two, it's, uh, the, 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 the sky is lightened up with wonderful melodies. So perhaps we have to wait uh, some more generations in order to, uh, to succeed. Anyhow, we are part of the global uh, village by now. So in order to find the Israeli, real Israeli peace, uh, it's kind of, kind of problematic. But I'm sure in every piece we, 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 we looked for, there was some, some kind of Israeli. Because people were li are living here and they're hearing Israeli radio and they are somehow absorbing Israeli music from all generations. And even if it's not on the surface, down there, there is something uh, Israeli. But you have to, to look hard in order to, to find it. Ofra. I quite agree with Oded. Um, regarding the fact that, except in this piece of Alone Khoshtan walking, I think walking on the shoulders of giants, it in was the called, shadow of in, giants. The, in the shadow of giants, that also had some quotes from Mordechai Seter, I think, yes. and Pautosh, um, which was very fascinating to me, um, to, to really see that he's relating to this thing, because what I really miss, and not only in piano compositions, but in general, mm. is the feeling that, that we have here a corpus of of Israeli local culture that is preserved. And I think th this is really the important thing I mean, because I feel that often when we talk, to, talk about, oh, the Israeli music is not played enough, often the discussion uh, goes in the direction of, oh, the poor composers, they're com they're, um, they need to get uh, their pieces performed. But th I'm talking about composers that, are, that do not live anymore. The, I think this is the important thing that we, we want, I, I feel that, there is a real need to have um, an understanding, a knowledge, an affinity to this 
huge body of music of Israeli composers that lived here and worked here for many, many years and, and really left a tradition for us. And I think that if we look at in uh, uh, places like England, for example, I mean, they play all the time. Britain, they play Tippett, they play other British composers, I mean, soloists, orchestras, these things are respected. And I think that if I looked at the uh, pieces that we got, at these 50 pieces, the fact that so few of them had something to do with the tradition of the music that, that was composed here over the last, uh, I don't know, 90, 80, 90 years, I, I think th this was for me a bit, yeah, sad, alarming, but, um, yeah, a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree with everybody because if you don't have a past, you, sh you, you will not have a future. And that brings me again to the education <laughs> thing because you see, everything is connected to, that's what I felt also that when a young composer does not know the music of Mordechai Setter, he knows one piece of Mordechai Setter, but not the whole range of piano repertoire of Yosef Tal. Or the, this generation, uh, the whole generation that lived here and created music in a different atmosphere, this is our history. If we don't learn the history of Israeli music through the playing, and I'm saying about little kids, I'm, I'm telling you that uh, the Milky Way of Andre Haidu, which is the micro, I'm calling it the Israeli microcosmos, <laughs> but so a little of the Israeli young pianists know this repertoire and composers too. They did not study this piece. So uh, I think you need to have the education. You have to need the, the, you need to be curious. I think many composers and many pianists as well are not curious enough to know what have been composed here since like Offer said the, the last hundred years. אני חושב, אם מותר לי להוסיף, הצלחה של נחושתן זה גם, הוא הפסנתרן שמנגן כל יום. הוא מנגן ג'אז, הוא ג'אזמן פסנתרן, זאת אומרת, החופשיות שלו, הבלטואוזיות שלו באה מהחוש פסנתר שהוא כל יום מבצע, הוא יודע מה קורה. זה בדיוק, מדי פעם יש בן אדם שחושב יותר מדמיין, הפנטזיה, פסנתר שלו יותר דמיוני משהמציאותי. זה בדיוק ההבדל, מדי פעם זה מפריע, רק חופשיות זה טוב, פנטזיה, אבל הפסנתר הוא הכלי. הכי אינטלקטואלי, הכי אינטליגנטי, ולמצוא שפה איתו משותפת, זה לא קל. זה לא קל. נחושתן ממש הצליח מבחינה זו. ג'וזף ברדנשווילי says that piano is a difficult instrument and to, to bond with it intellectually is not trivial and that's one of the reasons that he thinks that uh, the composition by Alon נחושתן is successful because he himself is a pianist and even a jazz pianist yes. and, uh, and he has a very good uh, uh, ability to play and bonding with the piano. Let me uh, uh, return to uh, Sir Junatra that I've mentioned before. Uh, we have decided as a third comp composition to ask uh, Sir Junatra to, uh, to uh, uh, put in our list of compulsory works one of his piano compositions. Uh, and Natra celebrates, has just celebrated his 96th birthday in April, so we extend our greetings to him. And uh, the, the composition that he chose to be performed uh, is the street, three street cottage for concert piano. I'm delighted to present pianist Alon Kariv, who will perform for us uh, this composition. Alon Kariv studied at Juilliard School of Music and is now a student at uh, Buchmann Meta School of Music. He is a winner of the International Merkin Hall Piano Competition in 2015, and the first prize winner in the Piano Forever Competition in Ashdod in 2012. Uh, Alon has also represented Israel in the Arthur Rubinstein Piano Competition in Beijing in 2016. So let's hear three street cortege for concert piano by Sergio Natra, Alon Karif.
Bravo, and thank you, Alon Kariv, for performing the three street cortege for concert piano by Sergio Natra, uh, one of the compulsory Israeli uh, pieces in the next uh, Rubinstein competition. I have a question. I wanted to ask that alone, but since he's microphone-less, uh, I will ask Ofra and Michal. If you'd have to schedule this piece in a recital, what would be the piece before that and the piece after that? This is a very difficult question. Uh, well, I'm very curious. To know. I'm, I'm asking now my students all the time. They complete a piece and I say, all right, give the performer a hint. What should be the piece that will be played after this piece? So, can I answer? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then you can. Uh, I think this piece uh, communicates with the uh, second piano sonata of Chopin, with the funeral march. So it cannot be and, played before. And after. Uh, with the uh, Le Gibet uh, of Ravel. <laughs> but let's see what do you think. I think I would put maybe something uh, very contrasted. Uh, not the Goldberg variations, of course, it's too long. <laughs> but something maybe more intimate before. I would put maybe Kinder Tönen by Schumann, you know, mm. uh, because it's such a contrasting character. And I think, for me, I like when programs are very much contrasted by all means. So this is my taste, of course. <laughs> and it's very difficult to play this piece after. But I think it represents exactly the time that we are living in. That, that's what I feel And like. the two contrasts that we have discussed, uh, the virtuosic uh, and piece the poetic. and the melodic poetic piece. Exactly. Ofra? It's hard for me to say, actually, maybe Oded knows this. I, 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 I can spend months thinking about what, what to put after and before things. Exactly. I, mean, I, I really spend w weeks of my, of my life just thinking about, because, because I often play such pieces that are more modern or, let's say, more difficult to listen to. I always try to find the place for them in the program. So I really, it's really difficult for me to just now uh, quickly say what it is. Actually, I had a thought while he was playing that I would maybe put something by Charles Ives. I, I would go for that or even one of the more strict pieces by Bartok. It has to be a piece that doesn't have this kind of duality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, your, your choices are sometimes Bach, mm -hmm. but, you know, between Bach and Ives, I think that, that would have made it very interesting. That would have put this piece in, in a good light because what will happen in the competition that it will be played before uh, between Ravel and Rachmaninov and that will... That would be difficult. Yeah. It would be very difficult. I mean, I, 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 I have to figure out how people survive judging these, these <laughs> competitions, <laughs> really. Only the, the legal answers. I mean, don't, yeah. don't, don't, you know. Well, let me go back to Israeli music and uh, <laughs> ask maybe a partly provocative question. Uh, I don't know if it's provocative, but it comes from the heart. Some people say that there is no public interest in Israeli music. It is hard to attract young audience or audience in general to contemporary music and specifically to Israeli music. What do you think? Uh, I will ask Yosef uh, Badanashili first. יש כאלה שטוענים שקשה שהקהל הישראלי או הקהל בכלל לא מוצא עניין במוזיקה של מלחינים ישראלים ושקשה למשוך קהל ובפרט קהל צעיר למוזיקה בת זמננו ולמוזיקה הישראלית. מה אתה חושב על זה? אני חושב שזה טעות וסתם מגזימים, כל דבר אפשר להגזים אבל מוזיקה ישראלית היא כבר קיימת, יש לו יופי, יש לו היסטוריה כבר ממש, זה לא יום אחד, לא יום שתיים. ושני, זה סתם מבלבלבין לנו מוח שכאילו הקהל לא רוצה לשמוע. אני יכול להגיד על הצלחות ענקיות בחו"ל של מוזיקה ישראלית, גם בארץ. אני אישית הייתי, ראיתי הצלחות של מלחינים שלנו, הקהל קם ברגליים, ממש 15 דקות עושים כפיים בהצלחות ענקיות. פשוט זה אלמנט פרובינציאלי שכל עם 
אם תשאל גיאורגים, אני מגיאורגיה, והוא מגיד, אה, אין לנו מלחינים, אבל אתם יודעים, אין לנו פסנתרנים, אבל אשכולה של פסנתרנים גיאורגים, הם מלחינים מצוינים, הם פשוט שולטים בעולם, לא מדבר על הווקל והשירה, ו... זאת אומרת, זה סתם בעיה של הפרובינציאליות, ואני חושב, פחות, מי שאומר על זה, זה פחות אינטלקטואלי. אינטלקטואלים באים בקונצרטים, ממלאים עולמות שלנו, בפילהרמוניה יושבים שלושת אלפים אנשים כל יום, מתי שיש קונצרט. יכול להיות זה פשוט סטיגמה מסוימת שמישהו הכניס בראש, זה, אם יש יצירה ישראלית, הקהל לא יבוא. אני יכול להגיד, הקהל בא. אני כתבתי אופרה גדולה, מראש אמרו שזה לא יכול להיות שזה הקהל, יכול להיות, לא, אי אפשר למכור איתו. בסוף זה הצלחה, לא רק עניין שלי. חברים יושבים פה, קולגות שלי, אתם מסכימים, יש קונצרטים, מוזיקה קאמרית, ומלא, בא הקהל, נהנה קהל, וזה החיים שלנו, זה, אי אפשר להגיד שאנחנו לא קיימים. אחרי שנים אגידו שאנחנו היינו בתקופה ברדנשווילי, יכול להיות בתקופה <laughs> עודד זהב, בתקופה המלחינים המצוינים שמייצגים מדינה. מי שמייצג מדינה, סוף סוף אנחנו, אנשים שמשקיעים בתרבות שלנו, וזה ה... So let me translate, יוסף ברדנשווילי says that it's total exaggeration or mistake. The Israeli music exists for many years. It has its history and its beauty. And, uh, and uh, it's a sort of uh, saying that people are used to say, but the reality is different. From his experience, uh, uh, the audience wants to listen and hear uh, contemporary music and Israeli music. The halls uh, are full in many concerts, and even when it's a bigger challenge like a full Israeli opera, that he wrote as an example, uh, he says that he got a lot of audience and uh, a lot of enthusiasm. What do you think, Moshe? Yosef, uh, you are too optimistic. <laughs> as yes. a one, as a man, <laughs> a person who <laughs> lectures a lot about music and educates a lot of uh, wide audience, I would like to tell you, the audience doesn't like to be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you cannot educate an audience and you cannot fight an audience. As the minute you come on stage with a, modern peace, you are in fight. You are in a war with, an, with the audience. You have to, to, to know that they want, basically when they come to concert, they want to enjoy themselves. And listening to, 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 to modern music is kind of a, 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 a measure that you have to learn and you have to understand a little bit in order to appreciate. Our audience, I'm No, unhappy, I'm, I'm very happy, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I want to tell you, is not taking the chance of listening to new music because they don't want to make an effort. They want to enjoy themselves as easy as they can. Well, What do you think uh, as, the, I, I as think the director of the Israeli <laughs> Music Fest? I think we are very lucky that no one cares about our music. It gives us an incredible freedom. Moshe and Yosef, <laughs> my colleagues, have probably worked in the theater where, you know, I mean, they will ask you, do you want this chord or do you want us to sell 20 more shows for the Nesciona Echala Tarbut? I don't know, I still have the faces of uh, some, uh, 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 not artistic, but general managers of, of, uh, of theaters or, or of movie people. So, you know, so people don't like our music. That's fine. I write it for the people that do come. that do like it. I believe that all of our music is good music. I think there is a lot of communicative pieces. I don't think anyone writes here music in order to challenge or to, to, uh, to annoy the audience. On the other hand, the very fact really that we are not running a commercial business here allows us to do a lot of things. And if we, if we mentioned Charles Ives, he had to be a, an insurance salesman in order to obtain music that At its time, no one understood. That's very fine. So we, we teach, we do other stuff, and we write our music as long as we have at least two pianists that believe in our music, from which at least one performed my music. <laughs> <laughs> Let's use the time to settle some accounts. Uh, <laughs> that's fine, that's enough. I'll, I'll do this 50%. <laughs> so who, who, who Please, should we give continue. the permission to <laughs> speak <laughs> now? I must tell you, I mean, I listened to what Yosef said and what you said, what Moshe said, and I played your compositions, this was 10 years ago, in front of young kids, of high school kids, 
I did this recital in front of the music uh, students and they enjoyed themselves so much. I must tell you that it depends who is the audience that comes to listen to this music. The young people love that music if you communicate and you tell them about the composers and you tell them about the pieces. And uh, the proof is that they grew up and today they're studying in our school, in the Buchmann Meta School, and the pieces are on YouTube and the students want to play this music because they are educated to do so, because they heard it when they were 15. And I'm coming back to the young age, because the younger the kids knows and plays and listens to the music, the less he's afraid of it. And do, he, do it's natural, that, like any other music. Our audience is very old. Yeah. <laughs> do you think that this approach uh, Most of our audience work? is very Michal. old, but not all of our do audience. Do you think that yes. this approach can work with the uh, uh, adults? I'm sure it is because we have to be patient. If, again, we will educate our young kids and big masses, and if the country and the government will allow us to do that, and if the country would support this thing, we will do it. But you are I'm talking about future adults, and I'm talking about current adults or maybe even the older generation. If we approach them in the manner that you do with the, with the young children, will it, will it help? I'm sure it is because most audiences want to know who the composer is. And I know for many concerts that I played Odette's music and Moshe and, and the composer is communicating with the audience and talks to them and explains about what made him write this music. I think the personal contact with the composer is the most important thing to understand his music. I, and that's a story that I, I played many years ago in a competition in South Africa when I was very young. And I had to play a piece by a South African composer that I never knew its name and I forgot his name. But I wanted to meet the person who wrote this music. I really wanted that. So maybe in the next Rubinstein competition, the performers and the contestants can meet in person the composers who wrote the pieces for them. I think it would be wonderful. Basically, they don't. They don't come to the composers. They don't care about them. Because they're not educated okay, to do so. This is a point to consider. Ofra, what do you say? It's a matter of business. The manager who is working on the new one is not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Yosef Badanashvili says that the music or artistic directors should take responsibility and sometimes they hide before the saying that it's not commercial enough, that it's, it is difficult with the income and so on. Ofra, what do you say? Yeah, I want to say, I have a few, few points that I want to say. First, I find it sometimes very disturbing that there are so many comments about uh, the unpopularity of uh, Israeli music or modern music while actually... All music is going down and down in, in uh, attractivity. All classical music is going down and down in attractivity to audiences. And I find it very <laughs> uh, difficult to understand that uh, people who, who play, perform, and promote classical music, which in itself is going down in popularity, are, <laughs> are, are so critical about the fact that uh, modern music is not popular. The other thing I wanted to say is regarding what Michal said. I also pref truly believe that... A lot of it has to do with presentation and with performance. I think that, uh, I mean, it's just natural, but I think uh, a lot of the performances we hear of new music are maybe just not good enough uh, in order to make people like it. Okay. And I think that and sometimes true. we hear performances of Israeli music that I think, okay, if Beethoven would have be been played like this, then people would maybe also not like this. Okay, a lot of it has to do, has to do with the performance as we, and with the presentation. I definitely had many experiences here and abroad with Israeli pieces that I played, and I also explained explain something to the audience, and I think also adults who uh, never heard this kind of music before were quite happy to hear it. And the last thing I want to say is that I completely agree with Oded regarding the fact that if you say Israeli music is not popular, to me personally it doesn't really matter. Um, I feel <laughs> that playing Israeli music is so much part of what I am, and I feel that this music is actually what is making me as an artist relevant relevant to the place I live in, relevant to the time I live in. And very often, I think we as performers have the, f the feeling, 
uh, oh, I'm playing, th this composer asked me to play his music and I'm playing his piece, I'm doing him such a favor. It's so nice of me and then I will even perform it ab abroad. He will probably be so happy. I think we have to somehow change our attitude. Actually, if anyone is doing a favor to anyone, these are the composers that are actually keeping, our mu keeping my form of art alive. I mean, if, if this music, if there would be no Israeli music composed in Israel, I, as a performer, could not be relevant to the place where I am. It's, and of course, I love playing Bach and Mozart and Chopin and everything, but I think that playing music is not only a meditative, uh, philosophical art, it, it is also a social art, it is a social act, it is also a political act. And the fact that I'm here and I'm playing this music, also of uh, Yosef Bardanashvili and also of, um, well, Odette <laughs> will be as <laughs> so angry. <laughs> We'll the, later. <laughs> the, fact, the fact that I'm playing music of people from all kinds of uh, parts of, from, of Israel, the fact that I present that their, their ideas, the fact that I think about this music, I present it to the audience, I think this is really part of my identity. If I can say one last sentence, I, prefer, I remember once uh, after I... I uh, finished my studies at Juilliard, I got to know the great uh, Viennese pianist Paul Badura Skoda. And I asked him if I can come and study a little bit with him in uh, Wien, in Vienna. And, um, and he said, um, sure, you can come, uh, just now at my age. And then the, uh, the only thing that interests me really to play, uh, to, to, to teach now is um, uh, Haydn, Mozart, and uh, Schubert. So just bring these things. Okay, and <laughs> then I, I was at his home at Vienna, in, in Vienna, and, and I saw him sitting with his uh, cafe with the Schlagsahne, and, and, and I thought, wow, this man is so Viennese, he's so authentic, and this is what he's playing. And then I thought to myself, okay, I also want to be authentic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I cannot, I mean, of course, I can play other things very well, I hope, but, but in order to be really authentic to what I am, to what my identity is, I also need to play the things that are written in the place where, and in the time where I live. I believe, I think this is the best statement for a panel of Israeli music. Uh, so we, I'm sorry, but we have to conclude our broadcast uh, with a performance of uh, another Israeli composition which uh, has been commissioned for the last Rubinstein competition uh, on Water, Wind and Bells by Betty Olivero. I quote the composer from the score. Echoes of familiar piano works by Schubert, Chopin, Debussy, Berio, and Kurtag soar and float in turn upon the water, swallowed by threshing sea and bells, peeling as the wind plays on them. These scenes at first seem chaotic, random, unintelligible, but if we let the melody sweep over us, we shall discover in their murmur the poetry which nestles in our hearts. End of quote. Uh, while listening to the composition, uh, you may wish to identify those echoes from familiar piano works, and you can share your discoveries in the chat, uh, and uh, we will publish those that we have identified at the end of the performance. So uh, uh, we will listen to pianist Liu Xiaoyu, a finalist of the last Rubinstein piano competition. Uh, but before that, uh, I, I would like to uh, thank our partners, mention our partners. This event uh, was organized the RVP by uh, the Arthur Rubinstein International Piano Master Competition with the Buchmann Meta School of Music at Tel Aviv University, Haaretz Newspaper and International Piano Magazine in, UK, in the UK. Uh, I want to thank Michal Tal, Ofra Itzhaki, uh, Joseph Badanashvili, Odette Zahavi, and Moshe Zoman. And please join us tomorrow at 6 p.m. Israel time for a broadcast of Land of Milk and Honey and Music. Pianist Michal Tal will perform a selection of commissioned piano works written for the Rubinstein competition by Noam Sharif and surprisingly Odette Zahavi, Joseph Badanashvili and Moshe Zorman. The broadcast will include video recordings from a masterclass of Arthur Rubinstein in Jerusalem in 1978. 
if you're not, may, may just add one? Thank you. Yes, Sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, to the Israeli Music Institute, who was part of, course, of this. Yes, uh, I mentioned the Israeli Music <laughs> Institute, and I thank you for <laughs> reminding me. They were part of this competition, and they are publishing the, the selected works. So thank you for reminding me, Ofra. Uh, we will hear now Betty Olivero's uh, composition. See you soon, I hope, in the concert halls at the coming Rubinstein competition. Thank you very much. <laughs> 